Good morning, everyone. We're continuing on with our discussion of money magnetism. So let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, dear divine friend Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to you all. Help us to feel your presence. The most important thing in our lives is to know that we are not alone. Help that to become for us a real experience, not merely a belief, but the absolute knowing in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, that we are children of a Divine Mother who is ever looking out for us. Guide us and bless us and bring us to our eternal home in Thee. Om. Peace. Amen. So this is the Law of Miracles 2, and I am frankly and wholly plagiarizing from Autobiography of a Yogi, in which there is a magnificent chapter about the Law of Miracles, which is not what I'm talking about at all. To a certain extent, I'm talking about the chapter called Two Penniless Boys in Brindaban, in which Master accepts a challenge from his brother to travel from Agra to uh, travel Let's see, let's see, two pendles, to travel to Brindaban, right? And from Agra, I believe, where he's visiting and without any money and to be able to do everything that they intended to do without ever revealing that they're on a challenge from his brother and so on. And there's a line in there, the law of supply and, and demand extends into more subtle realms, uh, Master writes, than I ever imagined is how he put it. Although he, of course, knew he was just writing a story. Because the boys, in, in literally miraculous fashion, everything opens up for the boys in just the right way, um, despite all practical objections to it. Um, many times over the course of the years with Swami Kriyananda, he would often be questioned by people about um, how he lived, how he built Ananda. It's, it's a very important fact to understand. When Swami was 36 years old, he'd been a monk in Self-Realization Fellowship for 14 years. He threw himself completely into the life with Master from the time he read Autobiography of a Yogi in 1948 when Swami was 22. He lived 100% the life of a monastic there. And at the age of 36, though, after 14 years, after Master had been gone for a decade, um, he was expelled, and he was given a few hundred dollars, maybe a thousand dollars, I don't know, and uh, told never to contact anyone who was in SRF ever again. He was just gone, completely cut out and shunned by, the, by everyone and everything that was his own life. Fortunately, his parents were still living and were able to take him into their house. They gave him a room, place to stay. They supported him. He was essentially penniless, although he had a few hundred dollars. Um, he had no friends. He had an absolute commitment to serve as guru and to be a disciple. And from that, from, from nothing except discipleship, his relationship with Master, he built Ananda into a worldwide organization and attracted many hundreds of people. My, I, I was one of them, you know, to, who, who had the same, who developed the same sense of dedication that inspired his life. Um, he gave away, he, over the course of the years, he earned millions of dollars, but he never kept any of it. It all just went through his hands to help Ananda. I jokingly said once, it's one of the greatest rags to riches stories. If it could be told on those terms, it rags to riches, it would be a magnificent story, except it's a story of rags to rags because he never kept anything of it. He did it all for God. 
Now, in Money Magnetism, in this little book, Master also reveal, re, re, Swamiji refers to the kinds of things that happen to people who give their lives to God. And he, he uses examples of saints, but he also is just talking about ordinary people who are living sincerely um, for a higher purpose. And I've spent a lot of time in this series talking about the ideals that we live by and, and the strength which with, with which we adhere to them and mold our behavior to our ideals and not give in to the temptation to cut a corner in the hope that it will work better for us, that we then activate divine laws. And sometimes those laws look like miracles because the energy just comes from, you don't know where the energy comes from, but somehow when it is required, the energy is there. Or, and this also has to be said, when circumstances don't come out in a way that you would consider to be the best from the point of view of um, the ego, ego's idea of what should happen, or even on a much deeper level, the ego's idea of how we should be spared suffering. And admittedly, that's a very hard one when people we love are put into a difficult position and forced to suffer ourselves or others. There is a, a part in us that wants it to be different. And that is the biggest challenge on the spiritual path is, is having the steadfast faith that if God does not rescue you in the way you think you should be rescued, that you're still being rescued. You're being rescued from delusion. You're not necessarily being rescued from immediate suffering. It's very, it's not, these are the ideals. This is what I'm talking about. These are the ideals that we have to keep in mind at all times. Now in um, the book here, I'm going to pull out some of the ideas that Swami uses. One of the fundamental ideas he talks about here is that um, in, in life, we always have two choices about how we respond to situations. We either respond by expanding our consciousness to include a new reality that we might not have chosen for ourselves, or that seems that might seem difficult for us to accept, or to expand our understanding that Divine Mother knows what she's doing with us, even though in the moment it might not be, it might be difficult to endure. Or we can contract our consciousness and make our sense of reality, of God's will, of what is good for me. We can make it smaller. We can even literally dull our consciousness, lower our energy, um, watch television, take drugs, drink alcohol, overeat, whatever it might be that brings our consciousness so that we just don't have to think about it, experience it, or feel it. And the whole of spiritual life is whether we respond expansively or contractively. And this goes back in a perfect way to many years ago when I asked Swami what the secret of prosperity was. And he said creativity, which is when faced with a set of circumstances that require a new response, because the response that we thought was going to work didn't. Um, and so now we have to find another way to respond. We have to just keep um, expanding our sense of the possible and keep going until we um, find what succeeds. I remember my father had one period of time in his life when he had a little bit of problem with work. He'd moved, we'd moved the family from Texas to California. My father had trained as an actuary which is a, a, a high-level mathematical profession, somewhat specialized. It's something that insurance companies use. It's how you calculate. It's how you calculate expectations. It's a mathematical way of calculating expectations, earning potential, earning loss. Lawyers, insurance companies. That's sort of where it's used. So he managed to get a job in Los Angeles, and we moved from Texas to California. But after a while, it 
it turned out that wasn't really a very good job for my father. And there was a period of time when he didn't have work until he then opened his own independent practice, which in the end worked out absolutely was a dream. It came out perfectly for him. Um, but during the interim period, I remember he was studying bookbinding. And I was too young to really understand what he was doing, and it certainly didn't seem to me like a comparable profession. But I, and I, I realize as time has passed just what he was doing. He didn't really know where his life was going to go, and my family was very traditional, and therefore the idea that my mother could work was never in the picture. It was going to be up to my father to take care of the family. And there was it was a little dicey. But he just put creative energy in a direction that he could put it, and, and more or less said something like that to me, which, as I said, still confused me. But now I understand it, and I really admire him for it. And because of that, he was able to start his own business and and proved actually far more successful than anything else would have been, a creative response. Now, there's another word that Swami uses when he's talking about the you know miracles and high ideals, and that's the word non-attachment. Now, non-attachment is a very complicated concept, and um, I've been working with it since the beginning of my spiritual life because it's a word that tends to come up very early. Swamiji has a definition in this book that I think is the most useful one I've heard. He said, to be attached is to lack the flexibility to adapt to change when change is thrust upon you. That's that's what it is to be attached. I mean, I it it it's a very helpful definition because oftentimes people think to be non-attached is to be uncommitted, and I've I've talked about this many times. Every time this subject comes up, because to be uncommitted is is not to be non-attached. It's to be afraid, generally speaking, afraid of being hurt, afraid of being wrong afraid of getting involved, afraid of having expectations on you that you don't want to have to fulfill. Once you sort of step down that road of, of commitment, then there's nothing you can do. You have a child, you have to raise the child. You know, you start a business, you have employees, you have to see that business through. You can't just walk away from them. When Swamiji was challenged legally by the same guru bhais who had expelled him when he was 36 years old from Self-Realization Fellowship, and then in 1990, he was expelled in uh, 1962, and 30 years later, um, because Swami had not just faded into the faded into the sunset as was expected, but instead had risen in great prominence in the context of Master's work. There was an attempt made to suppress what he was doing through the courts. This is this is. Um, a, a word has to be said about this. It, in the history of religion, especially in America where it's possible to start churches, our Italian friends were so bewildered by the idea that you could start a church. I mean, to them, the church was the Catholic church. You know, just you just don't go out and start a church. But that's why Master came to America, because you can. You can start a, a 5013C, which is a nonprofit religious corporation. And Voila, you're a church. Freedom of religion. It's I mean it it sometimes causes amusing things to happen in the name of God, but nonetheless it also opens the doorway for extraordinary inspiration and opportunity. So um there was an attempt okay, so this in the history of religion, this is what happens. Somebody innovates and brings forward a new revelation, which is exactly what Master did. Master, I mean, Master was uniquely qualified, or unusually qualified, not unique in history, but unique in this moment in time. As an avatar, he had a new revelation, and he, he gave it the form that the Western world is used to seeing, which is a church. Um, and... And what happens is, in America, a church starts, whether it's the Methodists or the Episcopalians or self-realization, whatever it is, or the Baptists or the whatever, the pagans, whatever it might be. And one entity starts, and then almost always there's some kind of a split. You know, some a few decades down the road, either someone is expelled or someone leaves on their own. And then all of a sudden, 
you have the first church of, and then all of a sudden you have the second church of. And that usually the split has been disharmonious, so the second church of is considered to be her heretical by the first church of. And the first church of is used to having a monopoly, and now it has a heretical competitor. And so there is inevitably an effort made by the first church of to do something about the second church of. So anyway, that's what Ananda got caught in in all of this. Now Swami's comment, though, was if he said, I am here not to defend my ego, but to overcome it. And he got caught in a very interesting moral dilemma for him um, in terms of his ideals, because in the American judicial system, if you don't defend yourself, you lose by default. So if, if you decide to take the high road and not answer these um, nefarious charges, these bogus nefarious charges, then the court assumes the charges are true and all of the penalties ensue. So that's one of the ways litigation can be abused in America because you can file any kind of a lawsuit and, and the defendant has to respond, which means they have to engage a lawyer, they have to spend money, and so you can bankrupt your opponent, which is another way to win. And um, so, so Swami's dilemma was moral, a spiritual moral dilemma, because I'm here to overcome my ego, not to defend it. And I don't, people can say whatever they want about me. I, don't, my, I am what I am before my conscience in God. However, Swami saw that all of Ananda would be pulled down. And there were hundreds of us who had given our lives to this. And Swami made the decision that for himself, he would have let it, whatever happened, happen. But for our sakes, because we had trusted him, he felt he had an obligation uh, for our sakes to defend what he had created. And this was Master's way of ensuring that it endure. And we did defend. And we were half defeated and half triumphant. Reputation was sullied. Um, religion was preserved. Freedom of religion was preserved. Now, uh, let me just think, oh yes, this is all about non-attachment. So non, when, when we are attached to something, it only becomes an issue if something threatens the circumstances, the individual, the relationship, the conditions to which we are attached. Because if we are able to maintain them, we can either be attached or not, and it never gets tested. It just is what it is. But when someone dies or becomes ill or their attitude changes or um, erstwhile friends become self-declared enemies or there's a financial crash, a war, a hurricane, a, a tsunami, I mean, just make a long list. Yesterday I was talking about an earthquake in which the Bay Bridge collapsed on a, a number of people and that was the end of their lives. Things happen that we simply can't control. And uh, that either we make we can't control our own judgment, and we ourselves bring about our own our own downfall, or circumstances um, conspire. But what happens is that which we are attached to suddenly ceases to exist, and that's the point at which the attachment becomes an issue. Um, prior to that, mm, it's still an issue, but we just don't know it. But in, in the course of prosperity and in the course of trying to magnetize money, if we are attached to a certain way that things have to be, and then things shift, now this is where prosperity equals creativity. Creativity is just the ability to see a, a new solution. Creativity isn't meaning that you can paint well or that you can dance or that you can sing. That's artistic creativity. Creativity in life is simply the ability to imagine another alternative. And in the context of the law of miracles or um, the context of magnetizing money from the point of view of self-realization as the true goal, attachment, non-attachment, and creativity all have to do also with our faith in God. Everything has to do with our faith in God. If you, if you trace any anxiety that you have, any dis-ease that you have, um, if you trace it all the way 
down, it always comes out to a, a whether or not, whether or not we've, a, I, I feel that I am part of a greater reality. If that greater reality has an active intelligence that is participating in my life, and if that greater reality loves me, just as simple as that, whether it loves me, whether it brings to my life a level of love and wisdom um, that I would not be able to generate on my own, that I'm in a partnership in this life. So our attachment, our commitment, needs to be to that partnership to that relationship. And then when Divine Mother shifts that one way or another, there's a a, a marvelous story told about St. Teresa of Avila, who was a very deep devotee of Christ. Um, She lived in a cloistered monastery. She, She ended up founding a number of reformed monasteries of her order. But she also lived in the established order at different times. And, uh, she would, they would have their, their cells, but then they would also have the parlor where through a grid, through a, a grate, they would visit with people and people would come to see them. And she was a very prominent um, person and the way the society worked, people would still come and see her through the grate. And uh, sometimes she would say to her visitors, I'm sorry, I have to go. Someone is waiting for me in my cell. And the one who was waiting for her was Christ. Jesus would visit with her, but she would have to pull herself away from the parlor, which is where they intersected with the world. And often Jesus would call her away from that because he wanted her not to be so engaged with worldly things. But when she was in her later years, she was still founding convents. And founding a convent with cloistered nuns was very complicated. They'd have to get in wagons that often were covered wagons and travel great distances over difficult roads because it was, you know, many centuries ago. And uh, when she felt the call to found a convent, she would just do it. So it was the middle of winter, and they were traveling under very arduous conditions, and the wagons were pulled by the donkeys or the horses into this river, and it was winter, and the river was somewhat in flood, and it was a dangerous crossing. And the wagon that she was in was overturned and she was spun around in the turbulent water. And everybody on the side thought that she was going to be drowned. And she herself thought she might be drowned. It was just, that was what had happened. She was following what Jesus had asked her to do. And if he was going to take her life, that was what was going to happen. She suddenly found herself standing on the opposite bank, having safely crossed the river. Her clothes were completely dry. So the whole... A moment had just been erased. And so she's standing on the other side, and Jesus appears to her. And he says, Teresa, my dear, don't be upset. And you're sort of referring to being dumped into the freezing water and nearly drowning. This is how I treat all my friends. And Teresa smiled at him because it was a love relationship between friends. There's just every part of that story, even that he tested her in that way, that he rescued her, then he teased her. This is how I treat all my friends. This is what this is what friends do. This is not some frozen relationship with a force that she can't relate to. This is her best friend, her, her truest love. He says, this is how I treat all my friends. And she looks at him and she says, ah, oh, my Lord, that is why you have so few. And <laughs> just a perfect, a perfect exchange, isn't it? But you see, Teresa was committed to her relationship to to Jesus. She was attached to her relationship to Jesus. But when you're attached to the divine, the divine is eternal and unchanging. So attachment is the nemesis for the devotee because we become attached to that which is evanescent. And when you become attached to that which is by definition, going to go away, we are setting ourselves up for catastrophe. Because then, when it goes away, as it inevitably will, at the very least, it goes away at death. And when we die, we don't want to be reaching out and grabbing for the things of this world as they just fade into nothingness. It's just it's pathetic, actually. And it's also futile. 
I mean, when you're dying, you try to cling to your body, to your money, to your relationships, to your attachments. In the Indian system, in the ideal Indian society, not it's not practiced now, but in higher ages it was, at a certain point, toward the end of life, when the soul felt it was time, you, you just walked away. You turned over everything that you had accumulated, you turned it over to the next generation, and you retired to the forest. And you lived out the rest of your life in the forest ashram with the guru, and just let go of this world, instead of just clinging to it to the very end. My, my father, at the end of his life, was in a care facility because his, his mind uh, didn't function that well in the world. His heart functioned beautifully. And he just became very sweet and really wonderful. But he, he'd lost the, the capacity to function. So he was being cared for. And it was always a dilemma to me because I'd see some of the elderly people, especially in the care unit where he was, and you know, they, all the accoutrements of their life, of their worldly life, were kept around them. Pictures of their family, the things that were important to them. And I would think, why would you be trying so hard to, to, to make this person remember, you know, what they are not, what they never were, except temporarily, and that which they're about to leave? Now, I, I understand. I'm not, I don't want to go into a big discussion about geriatric care because I can also see that it was a way to surround people with love. And of course, that was very, very important. But what we really need to do to activate, and I'm going to come back now to the Law of Miracles here, to activate the power of the divine is we have to cooperate with it. And as much as possible, we have to put ourselves in tune with it. And this goes back to... What is the real purpose of our life? Every conversation about money has to do with why do we want it? What are we using it for? What is really a successful life? And the the, the irony, and I did mention this yesterday, but I want to say it again. Of course, what we want is fulfillment. We, We give different forms to that, thinking this will fulfill me or that will fulfill me. But if we are in tune and fulfilled on the highest level, then all then, then the, the empty space created by all our other desires is filled with that divine water. So as, as Swami puts it, the higher rules the lower. So even though I think I need this family, this form, this money, this security, all of those things are, are material expressions of an inner desire for a change of consciousness. And so where we, where we need to commit ourselves is to living according to that right consciousness. And then when we're there, um, we become very, we also become, you see, very attuned to a, a creative flow. And we become very attuned to uh, um, original ideas because we, we start living closer to our own point of origin. So paradoxically, when we're, when we're attached to the main event, all the smaller events also take care of themselves because the law of miracles comes into play. And the law of miracles is um, simply the way the world unfolds according to God's true plan. It's a challenging teaching. There's no question about it. But it's the one that really works, that really works in the end. Instead of just moving the chess pieces around, like sort of on the horizontal level, when I started talking about this, I talked about how Swamiji explained that his teaching on prosperity was based on the fact that he was the disciple of a great master. And that was his explanation. Because we're, we're operating on the material plane from our spiritual awareness. We're operating in this world as Divine Mother wants us to operate. And all of the things I've been saying, I can't reiterate them all and I don't need to. What are we really trying to accomplish? How can we serve? What is the flow of energy? And if that is what we're seeking, and simultaneously we seek it in relationship to 
the loving divine mother that is the higher reality, then we work as her instrument. And every magnificent thing that we can imagine um, at least becomes a possibility for us. So my friends, God bless you.